Warm welcome to today's uh, I Buy IMD interview. It's my great pleasure to welcome Robin de Haas. He's a vocal leadership consultant who's been working both in the world of music with pop singers and classical singers, but increasingly also with executives. He's written a book on the topic of vocal leadership and a movie has actually been made about him and about the work that he's been doing in this space. And today we want to discuss what he's been doing and how that might apply to you. So well, welcome to you, Robin. It's great to have you with us. And maybe to just get things kicked off, let's step back a little bit and let, let me just hear, or let's just hear a little bit about your past and how you actually started getting to do this work, why you are doing what you're doing. So why don't you just share a little bit about, about your background? Thank you very much. Well, it started with an impossibility. I, I was born uh, quite severely handicapped in terms of the voice. Um, I was born with a cleft palate, which means the soft palate is not closed properly. And so that makes the child, at least in my case, unable to do consonants and vowels, which are the sort of the basics of human communication. And interestingly, as soon as I could not quite speak, because only my sister could understand me at the time, but I would say, my, my, my language being French, you know, I would say in French, which means I want to sing. And I had this intense attraction for singing, although I wasn't even understandable except from my, my, my sister who was four years older than I was. And that led to a journey of discoveries. You know, doctors told my parents, well, he might be able to get a job in his life, but, you know, voice will never be his thing. He'll never be a communicator. And sometimes life has a way to, to do this that it's almost like something in your soul says, you know what? Challenge accepted. And then, and then goes into it. And so that, that I think, started this journey. Where the challenge actually becomes your, your platform yeah. for learning. Yeah, because you see, the thing is, because of this handicap, my voice is so much more fragile mm -hmm. that I can only allow myself, I think, maybe 5% of the mistakes that other people can allow themselves. And so that led me through a journey of going through all of the voice experts, mm -hmm. whether it be for singing or speaking, and to hear what they had to say and also realize, wait a minute, this is not working on me because I am, I am a, a much weaker student. And so by being a weak student, but asking myself questions, you know, um, and thinking that, well, maybe there's another way, that led to incredible discoveries through meeting exceptional people who have done research on a very, I would say, honest and consistent level. Because you see, in the world of voice, very often it's gifted people. Mm -hmm. You'll have a gifted opera singer, and when, when he or she is 50 years old, they'll say, oh, let me teach now because I don't want to be running around in a career anymore. And of course, they haven't sometimes thought much about teaching, so... It's very idiosyncratic, isn't it? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like, this is how I do it, and that's it. And of course, as my structures are not the same as any other people, mm -hmm. that doesn't work at all for me. And so I, I really was in the situation of being like, well, I'm so sorry, but I'm, I'm doing what they're asking of me, and so, yet okay. it's not working, I have pain, and so what should I do? And that led to... It was actually a huge opportunity to really then meet people who had gone further, mm -hmm. who had looked into the structures, who had looked into, wait a minute, is this actually true, what we've been saying for 100 years mm -hmm. and 200 years about voice? And if yes, why and how? And, and what exactly is involved? And are there, are there differences between people? Mm -hmm. you know, is it really, like, haven't we gone too far into modeling one set of advice that we give to everyone. That applies to everyone. Exactly. Yeah. And that I've realized that a lot of things that we hear, whether it be about breath or voice, are what is perceived by people who do it kind of right, mm -hmm. but are not coming from a thought process of how to bring someone there. Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot of imprecision and a lot of things that are lacking conceptually which then do not allow people to express their, their whole potential. 
Mm -hmm. And so that's been my passion. You see, one thing maybe that's to tell from my story is that because I couldn't speak, um, I was bullied a lot. Mm -hmm. So I, I would end up in hos at the hospital. You got, actually got beaten up. Yes. Um, it was very unfortunate, but that, that was yeah. the situation. You know, a, a kid that cannot talk, that tries to talk. Yeah. I was writing, um, we have actually testimonials of this yeah. from, they found again in the, in the movie that was mm -hmm. dedicated to, to my life, they found people who were in, in, in school with me and they asked them, you know, what they remembered. And there's mm -hmm. this girl who, is expl who said she remembered that I was already writing poetry. Mm -hmm. And I would write a poem and try to go read it to the other kids. Mm -hmm. And their answer would be beating me up. So it, that, that's where I come from, right? Yes. And so at about eight years old, I thought it's not worth it. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to end my life. But then I had a thought when I was on the edge, literally physically on the edge of doing it in a very high barn. I had a thought and I thought, you know what? If I'm going to continue this, I really have to find love mm -hmm. wherever I can find it. And then a thought came to my mind, if I help other people shine, then there's a chance that some love will be present. Mm -hmm. And so for me, this research into my voice also naturally became a sense of how can I help others shine? And when I do that, whether it be with, with an executive, with an opera singer, with a long COVID uh, person who you know, suffers in their breath, when I can see them just get back into this function, into the untapped in potential that their body has to offer them, and I see their smile or I see, you know, I see them on stage and then, and then um, they write me a letter explaining how much it changed for them that's when I get the goosebumps. That's when I get tears yes. because that's when I feel profoundly reassured that things are okay and I'm not going to get beaten up anymore. Yes. And when so, things become meaningful. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Well, and so can. that's, that's the, how the journey evolved from um, really researching into mm -hmm. the voice to helping others. And that's also why, because I work on the breath and the voice mm -hmm. on their function, how to bring back optimal function, I think that's also why I've had so much strong connections mm -hmm. with whether it be with executives, with the pulmonary yeah. league, people with, and, and also that I've been able to design a training program mm -hmm. for, for practitioners to, to do uh, the same thing that I do. So that they can pass it on. Exactly. Yes. Because it's not about me. It's about the amazing human structures we all have and the potential yeah their yeah. potential that is 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 incredible you know you have people who are really struggling because they don't know how to use themselves mm -hmm. and when you assess what parts of their mechanism whether it be the breathing or the the vocal mechanism what part they are overusing mm -hmm. you bring awareness of that you build an exercise an exercise plan to really retrain the muscles that are not working enough and then train the muscles that were overworking to calm down a little bit so that you can have an evenly distributed action and then suddenly the thing functions again. Without effort. Yeah. It's really our idea in this current of thought through the people I met that really shaped me. I'm thinking of Lynn Martin, who mm -hmm. taught at New York University, um, also Irene Dowd, who, taught, who still teaches actually at the Juilliard School. Mm -hmm. The, the core is minimum effort, maximum efficiency. And that is what we want with people. But for that, you cannot have a cookie cutter approach where you give the same advice to everyone. You need to have assessment of what part is overworking in a person. This way you can fix that, make the other parts work, and then boom, this person finds their method. It's almost like you're creating a method for this person based on their needs. So we become completely student-centered mm -hmm. instead of being either the ego of the voice teacher or of the method-centered. Mm -hmm. And that's, I think, a shift in methodology that is very contemporary. Mm -hmm. I mean, student-centered learning mm -hmm. is, 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 I think, at the forefront of contemporary learning mm -hmm. at, at this time uh, in this day and age. 
and I think that in that it's a very contemporary approach to the voice that differs quite a lot from what other people are saying. You, you'll find a lot of articles that say, oh, take a deep breath, you know, expand your ribs, open your belly or breathe down. Or, and I feel that all of those, even though they are well-intended, mm -hmm. but guess what? You might be overstretching something that was already moving well. Mm -hmm. So I, you're actually going off into the wrong direction because yeah 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 and and I've had I've had people come in the studio uh, with with damage caused mm -hmm. by for instance this idea of take a deep low deep breath in your belly mm -hmm. that pushes on the organs and I mean it can really create big problems when pushed quite yes. far so yeah again let us rejoice in the delicacy of the structures and listen to them they are speaking to us they are telling us. Muscles that are overworking will chronically contract and shorten. We can understand that. We, when we know the design, we know the structures, when we observe someone, we can see the shortening. Mm -hmm. And that's what my life's passion is about. Because then I can help them and, and, and guide. And then again, I see them shine. And whenever I see them shine, it's, I feel like it's, like a, it's almost like a gift for that eight-year-old me. That whenever I see it's someone going back shine, to that time. I can go back yeah. and say, look, you see, you've helped someone. Well, and that, that is just, yeah, makes me feel accomplished. Thank you. Maybe to like, to like kind of connect to the, to the, to the audience that we have here with them, you know, exec, senior executives, leading people, also leading people in different contexts in having one-on-one -on -one conversations, having to give big presentations to a large audience. Why does their work relate to what you do in your teaching? How can you help and contribute to what they're doing? Yeah. Or maybe like step back for us and like just like share some reflections about what they're doing and why, why it might be important. You see, when you are in a leadership position, people will inherently listen to you. So basically you are in a position where you are speaking and they are listening. But the truth is that they're listening or perceiving on many different levels. And as a species, we are ruled by an instinct um, that researchers have called the fight or flight response. And that's to promote the survival of the species mm -hmm. in the sense that a mammal, if a mammal perceived there is a predator, so let's imagine an antelope, mm -hmm. the antelope is quietly eating some grass and resting, and suddenly there's a bush, and I'm taking you on a little safari here, and there's a little movement in the bush, and the antelope thinks, oh my God, here's a lion. Well, lioness, actually, because mm -hmm. uh, in the lions is a female who hunt. Uh, so girl power. Woo. Uh, so the, uh, the antelope is, is there, and the antelope cannot tell the lioness, uh, darling, I'm digesting. Would you come back in about 25 minutes or yeah. so? So the antelope has to be able to run away, right? And that, on a metabolic level, it, it involves drastic changes from the complete rest to absolute run. And there's an activation in the nervous system from the sympathetic autonom autonomous nervous system response, it's called. And that triggers many, many changes in the body. And I'm looking at the mm -hmm. breathing part of yes. that. And we all know that when we're scared, if I hide behind the door and I go, boo, on yeah. you, then you're going to go, ah. Like that. So you're doing a short, pulled inhale. Right? Mm -hmm. Now, let's imagine we are a little bit later and the antelope managed to safely survive. Otherwise, the antelope is dead and the story right. is finished. And so let's say the antelope survived and she's really happy to have survived. Then she understands there's no more danger and she will go. And this is something you know, too, because typically if you come home from an intense day at work and you're happy, you're going to go, let go on a on a on a breathing level. You're going to perform an exhale that is slow and steady. Huh? You won't go like, Shh, okay, it was okay. No, it's a ah. There's this ah feeling. Okay, so let's go back to the antelope for a moment. Let's imagine that there's another group of antelope a little further. Those antelopes are not seeing the bush. Okay, they just see the first antelope mm -hmm. who runs away. Mm -hmm. What are those antelopes going to do? They will run away too because they've learned to identify that if one of their mates is doing that, that means there's imminent danger. Mm -hmm. How does that translate to us as mm -hmm. a species? Well, 
keep in mind that we didn't have the time as a species to evolve away from that fight or flight response mm -hmm. when in fact our context has completely shifted. You see, since around the 1500s or so and onward, first of all, we have medicine. So that means on a Darwinian evolutionary point of view, we might have stopped mm -hmm. the survival of the fittest thing that, you know, is mentioned in, in Darwinism. Then within the last 200 years, we have profusion of food in most part, you know, a lot of parts, of, at least in our society. Mm -hmm. I know this differs depending where mm -hmm. you are on the globe, of course. But this means that there is no immediate predator and that I don't necessarily have to hunt for food. Mm -hmm. But my nervous system has a little hand the time. We would have taken probably a few hundred thousand years for us to evolve. So we are still reacting in our breath as if there was a predator whenever something is upsetting to us. And this is, I think, the root of why I can have such a big impact based on what people mm -hmm. tell me on the lives of executives. Mm -hmm. Because if... Let's say you're an executive and you are talking to your team, but that same morning, your child was vomiting, it was very stressful, you almost got late, you had vomit on your shirt, you know, a, a terrible thing like that. You go into fight or flight, so you're like, oh, like that. And then you have to talk to your team. If you don't know about this, you're going to be talking to them from that manner of using the breathing mechanism, because remember, the fight or flight has no way to end when it's not a physical predator. Because when mm -hmm. it's a physical predator, you know whether it, when it's over. But you might be thinking about your child, oh, is he or she okay? Da, da, da. So it continues. But and, what, the, and the breathing pattern the, stays up. It stays up. It stays up. And what happens then for your team? A whole lot and lots of misunderstandings. They might think that you're upset with them. They might think that you're unhappy with their results. Or they might just feel it without even knowing yeah, it. Exactly. Yeah. They will, because their inner antelopes want to run away. So they're listening to you, but they are subconsciously analyzing the movement in your chest. They're analyzing your breathing pattern because their nervous system tells them that they need to analyze that to check whether there is a predator mm -hmm. on a completely archaic level. Mm -hmm. But because of that, then they might also think you're not telling them the truth. Mm -hmm. Or they might, so it, it leads to a whole set of misunderstandings. I remember working on a very high uh, exec at the, at the United Nation who had two secretaries and a bodyguard. And um, after about four sessions, I went in and they stopped me and asked me and they said, what have you done with him? Mm -hmm. what, what did you do? He's no longer screaming at us. Mm -hmm. We understand what he's asking. I was told later, this person had a very high turnover mm -hmm. that the secretaries would quit mm -hmm. because he would be perceived as aggressive. Yeah. But he just had a very strong discoordination between his breath and his voice. And he, he didn't know how to handle yeah. that. And so... It's interesting because there are some people who naturally do it well. Mm -hmm. You know, if you look at Martin Luther King, mm -hmm. his I have a dream speech, and of course it's for thousands and thousands mm -hmm. of people, so the movements are quite big and so on. But if you look at the breathing patterns, at the way to use the voice, he basically does everything. Like a textbook. Yeah, it's really, really quite remarkable. And, and of course, many people follow him. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, I think that for a lot of executives, at least those that I'm meeting, there's so much potential that mm -hmm. they're not using. And I guess it's really on a different level as well because you know, we, we talk a lot about body language, using your hands, having facial expressions, but yeah. really you're working on, on a different level in that sense where you know, I might be doing all kinds of things with my hands if my breathing doesn't correspond yeah. with what I'm trying to convey. Yeah. It's just going to be confusing, isn't it? Yeah, I, I, I do have to recognize that a lot of the approach on public speaking that I have read, because I've read everything that's been, well, not everything, of course, but to my knowledge, everything I could get because of all my problems as well, I honestly find that it stays a bit on a shallow level. Because you see, okay, let's let's make a little experience here. 
I'm going to go into a, a fight or flight type mm -hmm. inhale. So I'm going like that. Mm -hmm. And so I'm maintaining my chest up, blocking it like that, and breathing mm -hmm. like this. And now I'm opening my hands and I'm saying, hello, everyone, how are you? But I, I am not congruent. There's not, for me, true leadership comes from within. It comes from your organ column. It comes from being also aligned between your values and how you read the world. But you cannot do that if you are into fight or flight. Mm -hmm. Because the fight or flight response, the way it changes, if you look at the way it changes vision, you know, the, 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 how we hear, mm -hmm. how we are, we are uh, hearing things and all Everybody that. Everybody gets focused on yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So to try to save you. Mm -hmm. But you see also in the decision process, in today's world, where you have, you know, we've had a pandemic, we have wars going on on, on the border of Europe, we have things like that. It's a very complex world. Plus, you have the digital, the digital revolution that has changed yeah. everything, blah, 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 all of that. If I'm a leader, I am now faced with very fast, disruptive... Like having a lot of lines around you, basically. Yes. So I cannot make a proper decision or have a good decision process if I'm into fight or flight because my whole inner animal mm -hmm. wants to go black or white. This is right, this is wrong. This is the way we've always done it. That's the way we'll go. Mm -hmm. And when you look at companies' failures to understand disruptive change, I do wonder if it's not also caused by a culture of fight or flight mm -hmm. where then people are much more narrow in their mind Whereas if you can cultivate this use of your breath mm -hmm. and just let the air flow in, but know that your main job is to exhale because exhale is what you do in nature when there is no danger. So if you exhale calmly, I'll, I'll teach you an exercise for that at, towards the end. I mean, I'd love to share that because it's, it's been so helpful for me. If you know that your job is to exhale and you focus on that and you do that for five minutes, Five minutes is a long time when you mm -hmm. focus just on that. Then you start seeing things in a different way. Okay, there's this, there's that, there's that, there's this. How can I fit the various levels of reality and the shifts with the future of my company? It's been very interesting also in this journey with executives of making them talk about their team, their companies, all of that. Of course, all under the, the, the label of um, uh, professional secrecy, mm -hmm. but just to hear when they go into fight or flight. And how that changes uh -huh. the voice. And then I ask them, I say, okay, when you're talking about that team, you're going to fight or flight. Mm -hmm. What's wrong with that team? And they're like, well, I don't, I, I don't think there's anything wrong. Think again. And then give me the names of each person. And then they give the name. And then on the one name, why this person? Because suddenly you hear the, you hear the whole, mm -hmm. the, the, the vocal cords are closing differently, you know, when you know how to listen, and I believe we all have this ability. I'm not yes. claiming at all to have unique abilities or God knows what. It's just that because I was so severely handicapped and couldn't talk, I had to work so much on what it is to talk that I'm hearing and I'm, I've trained myself to hear very small, subtle mm -hmm. change. But it's been amazing to, and I've, I've actually, well, we together as a team with, with the person I was helping, we've managed to, to, to avoid big disasters. By, by anticipating that actually this project was not right in the way it was. And the person had, had, had subconsciously realized it, but that information hadn't traveled mm -hmm. to, you know, to the, say the frontal cortex or whatnot, you know, like but where the awareness is. Yeah. And that, I thought that was fascinating. And, and why do you think executives struggle so much with that notion of voice and how they can best use it? Is it that they just don't think about it? Is it that they think about it in not an appropriate way, or they've been trained badly. What are what are kind of like the I the I, things that you see? One of the things I've seen is that people just haven't thought of it mm -hmm. as a topic. Mm -hmm. I've had I've had people say to me, "No, what only matters is what I say, mm -hmm. not the way I say it, mm -hmm. the and, content." Yeah, and then what I do is I, I play short clips of great speakers to them. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, and then I play an, an extract of themselves, mm -hmm. and I say, "Okay, you see, you're doing this, this, this. You're closing here, there, here. 
look at this person, blah, blah, blah. What does it make you feel? And usually it's like a big wake up call. Yeah. Like, oh, oh my God. Um, also, I have to say, I've had a lot of people who, because the world of teaching voice and breath has been quite based on people's own perception mm -hmm. of what it is that they're doing, but that they're not really sure, actually. It's not been re thoroughly researched, I find. And at least not hypothesized on a functional level. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, and what is... the causal mechanism is. Exactly. Yes. A lot of bad information is there. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, if you Google how to breathe correctly, mm -hmm. you're going to find about, I think, well, we did that experience about, well, was it like 10 years ago? And 80% of the searches were talking about belly breathing, mm -hmm. that you should basically, to breathe correctly, you should take a deep breath in by inflating your stomach. Mm -hmm. So going, like that. Mm -hmm. And our functional research and hundreds and hundreds of cases of experiences mm -hmm. show that this is detrimental. Mm -hmm. So it's actually the opposite of what you should be doing. Yeah, 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 yeah. Basically, what we what we need to focus on is the exhale. Mm -hmm. And we need to focus on, on a small and steady outflow of air mm -hmm. because this is what triggers efficient use of the voice. Mm -hmm. It also triggers efficient use of the nervous system because it helps us tell our nervous mm -hmm. system that we are not in a place where there actually is a... That the line is gone. Yeah. Maybe that's, you know, to, to kind of get to the end. Um, if you share a few practical hands-on exercises yeah. that, that our viewers might be able to, yeah, to implement yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, by themselves at home or at work. Yep. What we want to do is we want to think that everything in the breathing mechanism should be allowed to move. So that means that basically we have muscles in the rib cage and that these muscles can be retrained in moving or can be it can it can also be made very difficult for mm -hmm. them to move mm -hmm. so for that what i love to do with people is i have them sit basically on their pelvis mm -hmm. so come maybe to the it could be to the edge of the chair or just comfortable and they can or lean forward and just make sure that mm -hmm. they are seated on the pelvis they're going to find what's called in english the sit bones mm -hmm. which their technical term is ischial tuberosities but i find sit bone to sit mm -hmm. bone you know and to then move gently from the pelvis, just a gentle movement, mm -hmm. and then bring this gentle movement into the chest mm -hmm. like that. And that, again, promotes mobility. And they can make also small rotations and, and then bring it also to the neck, just a little bit like that. And then slow it down to almost be at the border between movement and non-movement, right? When you have that, place your hand in front of your mouth, open mm -hmm. mouth, and you're going to blow air on your hand, but it has to feel warm and be completely silent. So it looks mm -hmm. like this. As I'm doing that, I am practicing a small and steady outflow of air, right? Now, because this is a little difficult to maintain, we could ch change it after, after, you know, once we've done that, we could change this for a very gentle hiss. Mm -hmm. Like a hiss could be, and it has to be small because if you blow more, you're not in the, the right stimulation mm -hmm. for the nervous system. So something like this. And you do it as long as you're comfortable. You don't inhale before. You go with what, what is there. And you do that hiss. And then when you feel the slightest desire to inhale, you let the air flow in, mm -hmm. but... Silently, mm -hmm. completely silently, so that you are absolutely not performing the short pulled inhale mm -hmm. that triggers fight or flight or that is mm -hmm. part of fight or flight. Because what I'm saying is that whenever you do that, yes. the brain tends to believe there's a danger. And so you do that for maybe five minutes, just full movement, tennis. So it's really the focus on the exhale, like emptying out the air absolutely. and letting the inhale yeah. take care of Receive itself. Receive the inhale. Now, ideally, because we are moving like this, you might notice that you feel your back expand mm -hmm. on the inhale. When you look at the anatomy, between 60 to 70% of the lung tissue is in the back, mm -hmm. which is why if we completely release the frontal tissue mm -hmm. here, but our soft wall tissue, we deprive ourselves of from this incredible space in the lungs. And when you look at the lung alveoli, the little mm -hmm. cells, they have capillaries where the gas exchange mm -hmm. happens. O they have only so much. So if you breathe an enormous amount in a part of a lung where there isn't many mm -hmm. alveoli, 
you will be less efficient with that same amount of air mm -hmm. because you'll have less ventilation. Ventilation meaning how much air can actually be really integrated by from your body or or cannot. And so to allow the movement to be a little bit everywhere. And also when then further on, if they've practiced that, when they do public speaking, to make sure that they pay attention to the silent inhale. Mm -hmm. So they're speaking blah, 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 and not blah, 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 blah. And I can already feel how that has one or the other impact on me as a listener. Because if I do that, your inner antelope is receiving a threatening message and wants to leave and not listen to me. So, I mean, it's, it, in a way, sometimes I have the feeling that everything I'm sharing is actually very simple. Yes. But it's through researching and looking and questioning what people thought to be, oh, how the voice works, and that in fact it might not be exactly so good. And I guess it's really about creating the awareness of the, of the importance of voice yeah. and breath and then being intentional about how you approach it, that it doesn't just happen, yeah. but and then to, yeah, to adapt the, to the, the context. The feedback I'm, I've been getting in terms of better use of the voice, I'll, I'll give you one example. It, again, it was at the UN when, uh, when the guy had to do the same speech two years later, so after we had worked mm -hmm. together, and um, it's a speech that they do in front of representative of countries to get mm -hmm. money to fund the agency. It was the same speech. And you know what they told him? Many representative of countries, they said, you know, what you were asking for this year was so much more important than two years ago. And it was the same content. The same content. Yeah. He was asking the same, yeah. and they actually gave him much more money. Yeah. And so to me, that shows that this, this is key and this is what humans that think about these things have been sort of revolving around it. Mm -hmm. But maybe where I can be of service is that because I was severely handicapped, I have to go much more to the core of it. And you can articulate it now. Be yeah, because it's opening your hands, but on a locked, yeah. on a locked rib cage and pushing more too much air made it not possible for me where others could get away with yes. it, but they were still so far from their true potential. Yes. So Super. that's maybe where I can help. Big, big thank you, Robin. It's a pleasure. What we're taking away is the voice matters and to really unfold your potential of your voice, your breathing coordination matters. Yeah. And it is actually something that doesn't just happen, but it is something that we can actively influence oh, and yeah. work with and really make a difference by doing that. 100%, yeah. True leadership comes from yeah. within. A big thank you for being with us. It's a pleasure.